One of the most important recent insights about cancer, one that you'll find reflected now in papers in Science and Nature, uh, on almost every publication on cancer, is that each cancer is an evolutionary process in and of itself. This kind of evolution is short-sighted and selfish. Clones originate through mutations. They then compete for resources in space. Two of the key genes that are involved are called P16 and P53. These are genes involved in cell cycle control and DNA maintenance, and things like that. The greater the genetic diversity in a tumor, the more likely it will progress to malignancy. And if you recall our first lectures in the course, you will recognize here that genetic diversity, genetic variation, is the fuel that runs the motor of natural selection. So it's not surprising that the more genetic diversity there is, the faster something can evolve. That's going on in clonal evolution in cancer. Now, Cancers are not passed from parents to offspring, with some very rare exceptions in dogs. Their entire evolution occurs within the body and within the lifespan of a single individual. This has some consequences. Their, their evolution ends when their host dies. That means it's short-sighted evolution. Selection's operating on cell clones over no more than about 40 to 50 cell generations. That's not enough selective events to produce what we see as precise adaptations. It won't produce polished elegance. It will produce rough and ready stuff. But it can produce adaptations to local environments. In metastasizing cancers, we can recognize adaptation to lung tissue versus adaptation to kidney tissue versus adaptation to liver or brain tissue. Now, what that means is that you are born here and your somatic cells develop. That's your somatic evolution is this tree. And within that tree, there are genetic, epigenetic, genomic, and cytogenetic changes. So there is a lot of stuff that happens in your body that means that as an adult, your cells don't all look like the zygote that produced you. Not only have they changed epigenetically, they've also mutated somatically. So if we then look at what goes on over evolutionary time, here would be your children and your grandchildren and so forth, and each one of them would have a burst of somatic evolution going on that wouldn't be passed on, at least not most of it, to the next generation. In that process of somatic evolution, cancer is produced by competition among different clones. And those clones are being generated by mutations. So I'd now like to take a look at some evidence that supports the idea that cancers are genetically heterogeneous. That means you should, shouldn't think of a cancer as all being the same kind of cell, because it's not. It's many different kinds of cells. We want to take a look at some of the key genes that are mediating this process, and what are they competing for. So neoplasms are evolving by natural selection. So this is before you really get a malignant cancer. Uh, there is a long period of evolution. There's variation within the population of cells. We can see that indicated here. These are mutations occurring in our tissues. That variation is heritable. That's indicated here by a pink cell giving rise to pink cells and a yellow cell giving rise to yellow cells. The mutations are occurring both in the DNA and in the methylation patterns and the other epigenetic marks that are present in the cells. The variation is affecting the reproduction and survival of the cell. So in this case, the yellow cell is producing fewer copies than the pink cell. And finally, some of the mutations will cause the cells to ignore signals to shut down proliferation. They will continue to grow. There has been a lot of evidence collected showing that tumors have tremendous genetic heterogeneity. 
they are a geneticist's menagerie. This has been done by cytogenetics, karyotyping, genomic hybridization, in situ hybridization, sequencing of mutations, looking at loss of heterozygosity, microsatellites, methylation. There's just abundant evidence now for many different kinds of approaches that the cells in a cancer are genetically heterogeneous. If a pathologist looks at a cancer, here's an example of what a pathologist might see. So here are some cells. The nucleus is in blue. There ought to just be two of each chromosome, one from mom and one from dad. Well, here, chromosome 17 is labeled in pink. These cells have one copy of chromosome 17. And look at this cell. It has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 copies of chromosome 17 in that cell. And if we look at chromosome 11 in green, there's one copy in this cell and three copies in this cell and three copies in that cell and two copies in that cell. So just at the chromosomal level, there's great variation. If we then ask, what are the mutations that are really the most important in generating a cancer? Well, there are about 350 in the genome and two are the most important. One is P16. It's also called CDKN2A. It's a cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor, and it has two splicing variants. One of them makes a kinase that's important for cell cycle, and the other one stabilizes P53. It basically sequesters a protein that would otherwise degrade P53. The other is P53. Now that is a gene that produces a transcription factor regulating the cell cycle and suppressing tumor formation. It can activate DNA repair proteins. It can stop the cell cycle when it recognizes damage. It can initiate apoptosis if DNA damage is irreparable. More than half of human tumors contain a mutation in this gene. If we then ask, is there evidence that clones are expanding? because if one clone in a cancer is expanding at the expense of other clones, that's a signal of natural selection. That, that, in a sense, is natural selection going on. Here are some clones of melanomas, or pro neoplasms that could become melanomas in the skin. And here are the kinds of organs and tissues in which P53 and P16 mutations have been detected in clones that are expanding. So if you go into those tissues and you ask, is there a clone that's expanding and does it have a mutation in P53 and P16, the answer is that has been found in skin, lung, breast, bladder, brain, kidney, prostate, colon, stomach, and esophageal cancer. So it's a widespread signature of clonal expansion. If we look into the evolutionary biology of these clones, we can actually see that if we want to, as evolutionary biologists, we could use cancer to understand clonal evolution. Every patient is an independent instance, so we have lots of replicates. There are about a billion to a trillion cells in a neoplasm, so there's very little genetic drift. There are about 100 to at most 1,000 somatic cell generations, not much time for innovation, not very precise adaptation. Within a tumor, there are between 100 and 10,000 genetic alterations. And that allows separation of regularities in the fitness landscape from historical accidents. So we can actually see selection versus accident within a well-studied tumor. Lesions are associated with big clonal expansions. So for example, P16 methylation and P53 mutation are both things that are strongly affecting the frequency of clonal expansion. P53 is on chromosome 17, P16 is on chromosome 9, and then these are microsatellite shifts that are going on in tumors. The probability for a loss of heterozygosity in a tumor where there's a P53 is uh, less than 1 in 100. So it's highly significant. There are neutral shifts in lots of loci. And what that adds up to is a picture of 
a lot of different kinds of mutations, of which two are the most important, p53 and p16, that are being associated with clonal expansions in tumors. If we ask how important is the genetic diversity of a tumor to the probability that it will progress to metastasis and malignancy, we can see that in a study of Barrett's esophagus, a, a leading role could be identified for that genetic heterogeneity. Barrett's esophagus is a condition in the esophagus that is predisposed for esophageal adenocarcinoma. That is a pretty lethal kind of cancer. Carlo Maley and his crew used different measures from ecology and evolutionary biology to try to characterize exactly how diverse the clones in Barrett's esophagus were. So they could look at the number of different clones, they calculated a Shannon index of diversity, they calculated genetic divergence. If you just take the number of clones, you look at the incidence of esophageal carcinoma that would result from a Barrett's esophagus that had a certain number of clones. This line here shows that in the upper quartile, so in the top 25% of cases where the number of clones had been, number of different clones had been measured, after seven years, nearly 60% had progressed to malignant cancer. In the lower 75%, so where the clones were less genetically variable, the maximum was about 15%. So the number of clones is actually giving a pretty good prediction of the probability that the patient will get a lethal malignancy. Now, in general, clonal evolution looks something like this. The first thing I need to tell you is that the vertical axis here is frequency. And what you're seeing is when a color completely occupies that space, it's 100%, and when it's just a little point here, it's 0%. So 0 is not at the bottom. It's more or less being represented just by how much space a particular color occupies. And this top picture was actually developed not for cancer, but just to represent clonal evolution. The idea was this. The actually superior combination would be particular mutations in three different genes, A, B, and C. If you're in a clone, however, first one mutation has to occur, then the other mutation has to occur in the descendant of that cell, then you have to wait to get the third mutation in a descendant of the cell that has two mutations. While that process is going on, other, these other mutations can crop up in various combinations, but they will be excluded by competition if these are, in fact, the best combinations. If you look into what's going on in Barrett's esophagus and esophageal cancer, exactly the same sort of thing has been documented. So here, the pink is normal cell. The gray is a neutral mutation, so the mutation crops up, it spreads, then it drifts out, goes extinct. Then there's a P16 mutation, and P16 takes over most of the space in that tumor. A P53 mutation comes along, but it comes along in a cell that doesn't have the P16 mutation. Then another cell comes along that has the p16 mutation in the other copy of DNA. It's got two p16 mutations. It takes over. Then along comes a p53 mutation in a cell that's got both p16 mutations and it takes off and forms a cancer. So exactly this kind of process has been documented as going on in the formation of cancer in Barrett's esophagus. That view of clonal evolution in cancer is now standard. This is from a paper in Nature Reviews Genetics in 2012, and it shows pretty much the same thing as I just showed in the previous slide, except that now you can see the width of the figure is showing how many cells are around in the population. You can see the growth of the tumor. So this is time on the x-axis. 
These little stars here are driver mutations which are occurring. We start off with a normal cell, we get one, two, three, four, five. We start to get some clonal expansion. At this point, the tumor has become big enough to be diagnosed. Treatment is initiated. There is chemotherapy. The chemotherapy selects for resistant clones. The resistant clones expand. And at some point, the cells in the tumor acquire the ability to move and insert themselves into other tissue, and there is a metastasis. And in this case, it's a resistant metastasis. So this view of clonal evolution in cancer has become pretty much standard and accepted in oncology. So to summarize, a cancer starts out when a combination of germline and somatic mutations produce cells that slip out of cell cycle control and then acquire the ability to move and insert themselves. So first they grow inappropriately and then they move inappropriately. Cancers are genetically heterogeneous and they compete with clones. Clones are competing within cancers for nutrients and for space. Competition is generating natural selection. That natural selection favors clones that can disperse and can invade. This kind of evolution is not what you should think of in terms of dinosaurs and the origin of life. It's very short-sighted and very selfish. The cancer will die with the patient and it is not transmitted to the offspring.